Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, being here. Let me try to give just a little more context in terms of some of my comments today of the, of the world that I, I come from. So, you know, uh, was, was certainly excited to be a, a Stanford graduate and worked my way into finance on Wall Street. And I was in a, a, a energy and power, it was called pipeline and utilities. So I grew up learning everything about an electric utility and, and covered pretty much every one of them, some way, shape, or form around the world. And what I really became to, focused on was safe, uh, reliable, low cost operations. Later on in my career, career, clean energy worked into that, into that mix. But for me, it was very helpful understanding the guts of a utility and, and, and reliability was the, the, the core of that and really a social good that, um, that utilities uh, provide. Electricity deregulated in this country in the late 1990s and that changed the whole game. Uh, and they deregulated the power generation side of the business, meaning most utilities, well, but probably half the utilities in this country were required to divest themselves of their power generation to create a competitive marketplace with the goal of reducing rates for consumers. A lot, of, a lot of argument whether that was effective or not. I think it was for the, for the most part. But it created a whole new class of potential owners of uh, power generation. Um, electricity is a very difficult commodity to manage. It's really the only commodity out there that can't be stored. And, and when you have a commodity that can't be stored, and I know there's ways, there's pump storage, and, and we're getting there a little bit on batteries. Um, but it's, it's a real time. When you turn that light switch on, somewhere it has to be produced at that moment. So the volatility uh, around price of electricity when you can't store it is enormous. So on Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, I helped build a very large electricity risk management operation to figure out uh, how to manage this commodity. And from there, when we learned that, we started buying physical assets. I, I realized that, that um, you know, uh, this was going to take a lot of capital and I was better off going outside and, and, and raising that capital. So I've been traveling the world over the last 13 years to raise capital, about 20 billion now, because uh, power plants and pipelines and um, renewable projects, and I'll get to all of those details, they're, they're, they're not cheap. And uh, you, you, you can't do it. You can have a lot of good ideas in this world, but without money. And so um, uh, I formed a private equity firm. And a lot of people have notions about private equity, but I think they forget where the money comes from. Most of the money are uh, retired uh, teachers and, and government workers. Um, our lar one of our largest, about our largest investor is CalSTRS, the California State Teacher Retirement uh, System. But we have Texas teachers. We have the Packard Foundation. We have Stanford uh, University, all sorts of uh, children's hospitals. And we're really proud of who we serve and who are we are trying to get good returns for. It's a difficult environment getting good returns. Interest rates are very low. Um, and uh, to meet all of the pension obligations that we've promised workers uh, in a 2 or 3% interest rate environment, you need your equity returns to be pretty good. And private equity has really been the highest returning uh, asset class um, over the past 20 years, averaging somewhere in the 13% area. And so a lot of money is flowing into. It's also difficult to be a public company. Um, the, the rules and regulations around being a public company um, are frustrating to, to, to a lot of folks. And um, you can see you know, Elon Musk doesn't seem to enjoy it very, very much. <laughs> And so more and more companies are desirous of being in private hands. And so that's, that's what I formed. We're, we're now the largest independent generator uh, in the United States. We're the largest generator of electricity in California. Uh, we're the, uh, the largest renewable investor. We've invested almost $3 billion in renewables around the US. We're a control investor, meaning we own and operate everything we do. This is not a passive. I'm not buying securities in some other, other company. And so we have uh, almost 20,000 people in, in operations. Uh, managing um, all, the, uh, all the facilities. Um, uh, in California, we, we purchased a company recently called Calpine, which is one of the largest independent power generators. It was a $17 billion purchase. Um, and so we are the predominant, we are the largest natural gas generator in the state. I'm going to talk about that because natural gas is, is critical uh, to provide your reliability to back up intermittent renewables. Uh, we have a very large wind uh, portfolio here in California, and we own the geysers, my favorite renewable asset in the world. Um, uh, this is a renewable asset that is not intermittent. Uh, geothermal, um, and it's in a beautiful area up in, up in Napa. Um, geothermal, it's available all of the time. So this is baseload uh, renewable. That's kind of nirvana. We wish there was more uh, baseload renewable. This, this one asset throws off about $300 million a year of cash flow. 
the most profitable renewable asset in, in the world because of this constant nature of, uh, of the geothermal uh, resource. So my comments are going to come from um, you know, boots on the ground and, and having done this for, for over 35 years, really with the context of um, you know, a background of, of reliability is the number one goal. Safe operations, environmentally client, compliant operations, and now quite a focus on, uh, on, on clean energy. So I want to hit with some realities um, of, of just you know, some basics about the energy industry to maybe just uh, give you a little bit of a different perspective, perhaps, than, than maybe some of you have heard, and, and, and maybe not. So I'm going to start with coal. Um, as you know, the United States, um, oh, 10 years ago, was 70% coal and nuclear. Um, we're now probably about 50% uh, and shrinking uh, coal and nuclear of where our electricity uh, comes from. And the major culprit in the United States of the declining um, share of coal is natural gas because of the fracking phenomenon. Probably you know, one of the best things that has happened environmentally in this country is, is the uh, technological advancements in hydraulic fracturing and, and horizontal drilling. So we have abundant natural gas, which is a much cleaner fuel than coal. And because of its low cost, because there's so much of it, the price of natural gas has dropped almost 90% here in the US, it is outpricing coal. So it's, it's easy to blame you know, environmental regulations on coal, but it's predominantly just market driven. Um, rest of the world, not so much the case. Um, coal is a predominant fuel in, in many, many parts of the world, uh, still a predominant fuel in India and, and China, um, and uh, you know, continues to have a, have a, a leading share. Um, I get the data from the, the IEA, and a little bit, some of it is, is dated, but you know, that doesn't change um, all that uh, much. The International Energy Agency, I highly recommend their book of statistics that come out. It really is unbiased, and um, you know, they, they publish every year just volumes and volumes of, of data. But uh, you know, the brown is the coal projected to grow um, uh, by 2.2% 2, 2, 2 um, through 2040, which would make it the fastest growing fuel resource. So we have a little bit of a different um, uh, scenario in the United States with regard to coal relative to what's going on in the rest of the world. I think this is a this is surprise to people that the, the, uh, you know, the most used fuel out there and, and still one that is slightly the fastest growing uh, is coal. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, we, we put a lot of focus on coal as the, as the culprit. Uh, roughly less than 20% of global greenhouse gases come from coal. Agricultural activities have been a much larger contributor uh, than, uh, than coal. Um, this is a, a rough uh, you know, pie of where uh, CO2 comes from. You can see the bottom one, 24% agricultural forestry and other, other land use. Uh, we were joking earlier, I, I've, I've become a vegan in the last year, um, mainly for, for health reasons, and I'm, I'm the best thing I've ever done, and I'm, I'm loving it. But I also do feel good when I think about you know, not being so much of a hypocrite. It's hard not to be, I hate to say this, uh, and I'll look at myself, not to be a, a hypocrite when you come and you talk about CO2 and those type of things. And I'm going to get to our use of fossil fuels in society. And I flew in from, from New York today on a, you know, and that, that, you know, we have all of that. But when I think of livestock and I, and I think the impact of, of livestock and, and, and CO2, um, you know, I, 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 whatever, I feel a little bit better that, uh, that maybe I'm doing a little bit to, to make myself a little bit less of a hypocrite, but I'm healthy and I lost a lot of weight too, so I feel, I feel, I feel good about that. But coal gets the brunt of the focus, and as I said, less than 20%. I'm not saying coal's a good thing, I'm just saying we've got to put it in perspective. There are a lot of other sources of CO2 um, uh, in society. 90% of global coal consumption is outside the United States. You know, we are focused so much on reducing our use of coal, um, but that focus is not as great elsewhere. And even if we are wildly successful, have we really changed that much on the, on the planet? And don't forget, there's two kinds of coal, and there's one kind of coal that is flourishing uh, here in the United States. We're, we're a large owner of it. Thermal coal is what is used for power generation. And um, you know, when, when that coal is burnt, CO2 is, is released in, into the atmosphere. Metallurgical coal is baked. That is the primary input to steel. Steel business is booming in the United States. Uh, there's uh, uh, tariffs that have, have gone on steel, so domestic steel production is up. And uh, met coal is doing very well. So there are pockets of places in places like West Virginia that are doing very well. And while it has a bad name, there are no CO2 emissions that come from the uh, use of metallurgical uh, coal. Um, our share of CO2 emissions globally, roughly about 14%. It's projected over the next 15 years uh, to drop to 12%. 
predominantly because of fracking, predominantly because of the low cost of natural gas is displacing coal, not because of, of, of renewable policies, but just because the use of coal going down pretty, pretty dramatically because it just can't compete. And as remember I said, about half of the United States market was deregulated in power generation, right? So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an economic being when it comes to how I produce electricity. Uh, I'm gonna produce it with natural gas. That's the cheapest way to do it. That's where I'll earn my highest margins, uh, not with coal. And that's really what's causing the decline here. But still, uh, you know, 12% of the global total, you know, how much can we, can we really do? Um, and you can just see a, you know, uh, depiction in terms of just the, uh, the um, um, uh, CO2 emissions globally in, in, in tons and uh, you know where we are um, as a relatively small piece of the, the equation. If we eliminated all of our burning coal in the United States, global CO2 down by about one to three percent. So again, not a dramatic impact to uh, what's happening to the planet. I know some people, you, know, you maybe like to think you put a bubble around your state and it'll be great, but it's a, it's a, it's a global phenomenon and uh, we do have to think about it, I think, in a, in a global context. This is just another way of, of, of looking at it, of, of just the world CO2 emissions, which are expected to rise out through 2040, um, continue to rise pretty dramatically is the, is the base case. Again, <coughs> driven by population growth around the world, driven by the heavy use of coal in places like India uh, and China. And if we took all of our coal out of the mix, really doesn't change the trajectory of that line uh, very, much, uh, very much at all. China and India are contributing the most to CO2 growth. If you recall the Paris Pledge, uh, their pledge was to continue to grow their emissions at high level, um, only agreeing to slow their growth rate, not reverse it. This is a good, the top is China. The, the, the gray there, uh, till you see 10,000, uh, that was their actual a couple of years ago. Their projected um, out by 2030 was the red line. And what they agreed to is to back up the red line to the black line. But I look at that a little differently. That's agreeing to a massive increase in CO2 emissions, you know, wow. Um, United States, you know, we're now no longer a party to this. We were actually agreeing to reduce our CO2 emissions. India, same phenomenon as China. We're gonna increase them a lot, just not as much as we, we uh, thought we were, we were going to do. And you might see a little bit of why maybe the US was saying, is this really a fair deal of, um, you know, we're actually, you know, planning to do something. Now the US, you know, has done it. I don't think it's quite fair to give credit uh, so much to renewable policies, I give credit to fracking. I give credit to this phenomenon of an enormous amount of low cost natural gas, which has displaced coal as the, as the number one contributor to why the US has, has brought this down. There's another side which I'll get to, to low natural gas prices, which is not a good thing uh, for CO2, and that is its impact on nuclear. The United States is still the largest uh, nuclear power producer in the world. At the peak, we had about 100 nuclear power facilities. Uh, we're beginning to shut them down, they're old, is, is one, of the, one of the issues with them, uh, but they're um, becoming less competitive, less competitive because uh, the price of natural gas, it's cheaper to generate electricity uh, using natural gas. We'll do questions at the end. We'll have plenty of time uh, for it. Okay, California emission reductions and the benefit of renewable programs are a rounding error relative to China and India emissions level. China and India are expected to increase fossil fuel generation by about 2,000 terawatt hours by 2030. California expects a decrease um, of 28 terawatt hours in terms of fossil generation. So 2,000 versus 28. You know, how much does that 28 matter? I'm gonna to get to the cost of electricity in California, which is, to me is quite staggering. So we've put an enormous economic burden on this state, and um, maybe we're a model, and maybe that's a, that, that counts for a lot, that we're leading the way as a model, but in terms of the math, um, we're, we're not making a dent. That's just a depiction of you can see California in the bottom left, we're, we're a little peanut versus China versus India. Um, and you know, the, the red is, is what's planned to uh, increase from China uh, and India in terms of electricity generation from, from fossil fuels uh, through the end of this decade. And California, the little green is the decrease um, that we're attempting here in terms of less, less fossil fuel usage. Uh, reductions in solar and wind power costs. There's a lot talked about that finally wind and solar are now competitive with, with uh, fossil fuels. I would say that's not the case. Uh, I feel bad for those that have done an incredible job making solar panels more efficient and increasing the efficiency of, of, of wind generation, uh, but they haven't been able to keep up with what's happened in the price of natural gas. Price of natural gas, uh, we hit a high of about $13 per MMBTU 
back maybe in 2007 when conventional wisdom was um, we're running out of natural gas in this country. Um, we found all that we were going to find. Um, the reservoirs are being depleted. We actually were building billions of dollars of uh, LNG import facility because we're not going to have enough natural gas here. And so the price was through the moon. And then boom, the technological advancement of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. And by the way, the uh, technology continues to improve. The costs continue to come down. Horizontal drilling out as far as two miles in six different locations. Um, that this abundant supply continues. Demand for natural gas is up. Right? We're using more natural gas for power generation. We're beginning to export natural gas uh, for, you know, for LNG uh, uh, purposes. Uh, but still, um, that dramatic price decline has meant that natural gas has been a, a formidable competitor uh, with, um, uh, with renewables. This is just a kind of depiction, a couple of years dated on this, but you can see the production in natural gas, and these numbers are even much higher now in terms of the production of BCF per day. I think we're over 100 BCF per day now of production. And this is a supply story. This is a dramatic supply increase of natural gas, and as simple as supply and demand. And uh, the, the swamping of supply um, you know, is causing that price to plummet. There's also something called associated natural gas. When we frack for oil, a byproduct that comes up, we didn't mean to get it, is natural gas. And so that's, in that case, kind of a marginal cost of zero, just kind of flooding the marketplace. And so, as I said, we hit maybe a high of $13 per MMBTU. We hit a low maybe of about $1.50 per MMBTU. We're now back up to $3 or so. You know, we've had some, we had a hot summer, a lot of, a lot of usage uh, there, and uh, we've had a pickup in demand uh, from LNG, so that price has come up a bit but still a, you know, a, a, a dramatic drop. So as I say, uh, more expensive. And when I say more expensive, there's three things that I add back and three things that don't always get added back to the full cost of wind and solar. I think most people add back the subsidies. And, I want, and I'm going to talk about those subsidies in a second. The thing they don't add back, and I'm going to show you my, my electric bill from California in a minute, the thing they don't uh, add back are the transmission costs and the backup generation costs. Um, utilities love the um, uh, prolifer proliferation of renewables because they get to rate base tons of transmission, right? Most renewables are out in remote uh, areas, out solar fields out in the desert, uh, wind farms out in a ravine somewhere, and we need hundreds of miles of transmission, billions and billions of dollars of transmission lines. That goes right into your electric bill. That goes right into rate base. Uh, utilities love it. They, they earn a fixed rate of return on those expenditures. It goes as, in as a, as a regulatory expenditure. And uh, that's going right to your bill. And those lines wouldn't exist if renewables weren't there. The other side of it, obviously, is wind and solar are intermittent. And so we need, need more natural gas to back it up. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you know, it costs something to have these natural gas plants that are going to run, unfortunately, maybe some of them only a few hours a year. But you got a billion dollar investment sitting there that had to be made for those days uh, when it's not sunny and it's not uh, windy. I make this comment here, um, bothers some people that I make this comment that the solar tax benefits are actually greater than 100% of the cost of solar. And people say, no, 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 no. There's just this federal um, tax credit of, of 30%. Well, there's two other things. There's depreciation, uh, and then these are highly levered assets, and there's the interest expense that you get to deduct. And the depreciation is, I, I, I might use the word a little bit egregious, what, um, Solar uh, developers do is once they build out the system, they get a fair market value done. And they say, now that it's built, it's worth more, and we get to depreciate it on this marked up fair value. So they're depreciating, and now that we have accelerated depreciation in the tax code, maybe you can depreciate this as quickly as over five years. Depreciation is just another word for a tax deduction. Um, and if you're able to depreciate 150%, um, let's just pick a number of what it costs you to build it, and you do that over five years, that is a very large number that's going in as a tax deduction. Generally, when you build a, a solar field, you've earned a 25-year contract with California utilities. Because here in the state, we've mandated the utilities. 50% of their power comes renewal, renewable. We're now talking about 100% of it coming from renewable. How do, we, how do we make sure that that gets built? Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric offer up 25-year contracts to solar and wind developers. Well, you can take those to the bank. You lever them at 90%, and all of that interest that you borrow, you get to deduct that 
That's a tax deduction. So when I throw the federal tax credit, the depreciation on the stepped up basis, don't forget about stepped up basis, that makes my depreciable base much bigger, and I throw in the interest expense. Um, if my solar project you know, cost me you know, $100 million to build over a five year period, I will get more than 100 million back in tax credits. So you don't hear about this as much, and I'm not saying there's not environmental benefits uh, with it, but the subsidies are, um, are enormous uh, in this area. All right, I mentioned nuclear as, as an issue. So, you know, San Onofre, uh, there's two, two left in California, San Onofre and Diablo Canyon. Diablo, Diablo Canyon will be shut down I don't know, 2024, I think, is the year for Diablo Canyon that'll be shut down, something, something like that. Hmm? Diablo Canyon? Yeah, Diablo Canyon is still running. San Onofre is, is closed. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to report we won the contract to decommission San Onofre, so I'm at San Onofre almost every week. So you have any San Onofre questions, I'm your guy. So San Onofre is between Los Angeles and San Diego, roughly about a 2,200 megawatt. Uh, green, green, green power facility. There are no CO2 emissions from nuclear. Um, I, I like to say on nuclear, half of society loves it and half of society hates it. Most things in life, we're unfortunately in this country, uh, we're 50-50. Here's another one. We're 50-50 on this one. Love it, love it or, or, or hate it. Uh, to me, if your focus is global warming and that is your passion, boy, you should, you should be loving nuclear. Um, but there's not a, love these day, a lot of love these days for nuclear in, uh, in California. So San Onofre, uh, all of that, and, and by the way, it's a baseload facility. So not just 2,200 megawatts, but 2,200 megawatts that run 90% of the time. That's, that's like, we can, we can do the math, that's like 15 to 20,000 megawatts of wind or solar to get the same you know, megawatt hour production, um, carbon free uh, megawatt hour production. The main culprit, um, is natural gas. So if you're a 40-year-old nuclear plant like San Onofre is, and you want to extend your life 20 years, you're looking at the margin that you earn on electricity sales. Because you're gonna have to put in a few billion dollars to retrofit the pipes and, uh, and keep its age going. Well, return on investment, what am I getting for my product? My product is electricity. Mm. Because natural gas is the fuel on the margin, natural gas is what sets the price of electricity, in most regions in this country, certainly in California, again, that's the fuel on the margin, so that's gonna set the electricity price because of fracking, back to that thing again, just keeps coming up, driven the price of electricity down, that drives down the price, uh, the price of natural gas down, driving down the price of electricity. I'm not gonna earn much from selling uh, electricity. Can I really justify the billion, two billion dollar spend? And then let's say I extend the life for 10 or 20 years, does society want me? you got to put a big discount rate risk factor because you could see you know, a referendum in California or from the federal government shut down all nuclear. Uh, or there's an accident somewhere in the world and, it, and the sentiment gets even worse. So the investments are not being made, they're being shut down. And I would say it's going to be almost impossible for the United States to reduce our level of CO2 emissions if nuclear keeps coming out of the system, right? 20% of our power generation and um, it is uh, uh, carbon free. This is just a depiction of a grid. Let's say we have 30,000 megawatts on the far right of nuclear that, that, that comes out of the system. We have roughly 200,000 or so, maybe a little bit more than that, 200,000 megawatts of nuclear generating capacity. The United States is roughly about a million megawatt um, of capacity uh, system. Um, what's it going to be replaced with on the left side of the grid? You can't replace something that runs 90% of the time with renewables. Unfortunately, now we're going to hear a lot about uh, battery. We have some experts on the battery uh, storage side and we, 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 we so hope that there'll be a breakthrough, but there isn't a cost-effective major breakthrough yet on large battery uh, storage that turns a renewable resource into a 90% availability nuclear facility. So we're going to have to replace it with natural gas, something that runs all the time. And if the fossil replacement is 80, 90, or 100%, I'll, I'll, I'll give it credit. Let's just say 20% is replaced with renewables or renewables with battery and, and the other 80% with natural gas. At 30,000, you got a 7% uh, percent, uh, increase in terms of the, sun, the tons of CO2 that will be emitted into the atmosphere. 
So we really need to talk about the impact of, of um, low natural gas prices on causing uh, nuclear to shut down. It's been wonderful in terms of what it's done in terms of coal shutdowns, but we've actually, you're now having even a bigger negative impact on the other side um, by, um, by losing uh, nuclear. California cost, we gotta talk about cost um, because at some, day there's a, at some point there's a day of reckoning. In California, um, retail electricity rates, I like to say, where's the outrage? Have, have gone uh, through the moon um, and are, are, are really becoming the highest in the world. And we're gonna, I, I, wanna, I wanna spend a little bit of time on that. And it's really been driven predominantly, almost exclusively, by the very aggressive uh, renewable uh, policy here. Uh, transmission's a big part of it. But the biggest expense in your electric bill is the cost of natural gas, right? Because that's the fuel that's most predominantly used to make electricity. Your electricity bill should have plummeted in the state. It didn't plummet. It went, it went the other way. Electricity bills in other parts of the country and even wholesale electric rates in California are, are down by about a half. But retail rates, the rates to everybody in this room, have gone up uh, 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 dramatically. And so let's maybe go into a little bit of why that is. I take, I take my, my two main states, no New Jersey jokes on, on the right here, but New Jersey is predominantly uh, a nuclear and natural gas fired generation mix and very little on the, on the renewable side, even though they have huge subsidies in New Jersey, crazy as it is for rooftop solar, because it's just, it's just gray all the time there. We don't have a lot of, a lot of sun, but um, we have a little bit. And then California, you can see, you know, 20% renewable, and we have a, a, a lot of hydro here as well. So that's the difference, really, between these two states that I picked. But look at the, the, um, the top rate, and I'm going to get to summer rates, which are even higher than this. The top rate, 14 cents a kilowatt hour in New Jersey, and 40 cents a kilowatt hour. And I would put forth that, that renewables in the mix are the reason uh, why the rates are, are, are more than twice as high. If you look at the red line, if we go back over the last 10 years, California residential price, and this is the average, and I think the average now is pretty close to 20 cents, the average retail um, price. That's, that's the average. It's not the top marginal. I'll get to that in a second. But it has, it has gone up pretty steadily, continues to go up. Um, there's um, you know, a, a lot of discussion of rate design being a little warped in the state of California. Why are we putting all of this on the backs of retail consumers, yet wholesale uh, prices um, have, have gone down uh, quite a bit. Uh, there's a good uh, Stanford professor here, Frank Wolak, that many of you know, just wrote a very good paper, I thought, about this comparing the Texas marketplace, um, which actually has more renewables than California, um, where they have a little, a very different, let's just call it rate design, um, where uh, the retail rate uh, you know, has not uh, doubled and there's a more balance between wholesale and, um, and retail. But look at the price of natural gas, which is the blue line going down dramatically, your price of electricity should have followed that line because it is the dominant cost factor going into the production of electricity. And that green shaded block there, that's, that's the percent renewable power in the state. And so really the difference is, is the cost of renewable power. And everyone can show their studies that say that, that wind and solar are, are competitive. I look at the whole loaf. The whole loaf is how much do I pay every month? And that amount has gone up. So there's a, there's a lot of little somethings that have gone, gone into my bill, and uh, a lot of it has to do with the integration and the backup costs um, of that. If you look, again, retail, just is California competitive? California is not competitive and is becoming even less competitive. Um, if you look at the electricity rates, and they break it out by tiers, which maybe I'll explain in a, in, in, in a second, but you know, the average, um, you know, I think we're closer to, to you know, getting close to, to 20 cents, but we are dramatically higher than states around here. And so there's a lot of burdens on California's on the tax side, and we don't talk about as much of the burdens that are there on the electricity rates um, uh, you know, as, as well. So this is a little hard to read. Uh, this is my electric bill in San Diego. I have a home in San Diego. It's about a 5,000 square foot home. So it's a, it's a large home. It's not a palace, but it's a 5,000 square feet home. July is a, is a heavy uh, air conditioning month. I live five miles back from the, uh, from the beach. And they have um, uh, basically zonal rates, all right? I'm in zone one. In zone one, they have a, a, um, a baseline of how much electricity um, you get this lower competitive rate. I thought the baseline was just my average, and then I'll try to beat my average. It's a theoretical, 
thousand square foot non-air conditioned home on the beach. The difference in California, five miles from the beach is enormous, I, probably 10 degrees. Uh, the difference, but a big difference, and you don't need air conditioning if you live right on the beach. You'd need a lot of air conditioning if you live, you know, five miles back in, in, in Southern California. So I use a lot of uh, air conditioning. It's a two-story house, and that second floor to get it cooled down, I guess I'm a, I'm a culprit. And um, the number will scare you. It's a big number in, in July that I use, 7,273 uh, kilowatt hours, um, which is, if, if those of you that know what, you know, an average home and, and, and that type of stuff, I think the average in the United States is closer to about a thousand, and so maybe maybe seven times. But again, this was a you know it was a July month. But my bill, if you can see the shocker, my bill for the month was forty one hundred dollars. Okay, forty one hundred dollars. And the gas, they do a nice. The gas was two hundred and two hundred dollars, and the electricity was thirty nine hundred. And you can see a summer use. There's, there's all sorts of ads on electricity generation, transmission. Uh, uh, distribution, nuclear decommissioning, com uh, competition transition charge, local generation charge, reliability services. Uh, I don't know what the total rate adjustment, but blah, 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 blah. All sorts of little pieces that none of us are supposed to understand, um, I guess, there. And if just, they, they gave me my dashboard here, which is very kind of them. So tier one, zero to 351 uh, kilowatt hours. Um, I get 27 cents, which is no bargain, by the way. The, the national average retail rate is below 10 cents. Right, so my, for my first very little bit, 27 cents. Uh, tier two, 350 to 1,080, 48 cents. And my high usage charge over 1,000 to 55 cents. So if you average it all up, do the math, um, I average 54 cents a kilowatt hour. Where's the outrage? You know, you know, okay, I'll open my windows, I'll turn the air conditioning off, but still, I'm not gonna get that number down too much. Um, this is not only the highest rate in the country, it's about the highest rate in the world. I thought Germany, was a tragedy in terms of what they did in their energy policy, and I'll get to that in a second. And I think it looks like Andrea Merkel is losing her job uh, in, in, in large part of, of a lot of different things she's done on the energy side. Uh, but that's a shocking number. And go back to some of the numbers I showed you just in terms of California's impact on global CO2. Um, are we really getting you know, the benefit uh, for what we're paying? So I, I think there is gonna be a day of reckoning where I think consumers are gonna start asking the question, uh, is this working? You know, are we changing the planet, and how much do I have to pay uh, uh, for this? Because it, 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 it is dramatic, and there's an electric bill. It's not, 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 not made up numbers. Germany, as you know, what they shifted to, to um, uh, more renewables and less nuclear, not great cost, uh, among the highest in the world. CO2 levels have continued to rise in Germany. 30 billion of annual subsidies. It's depressed their economic measures. Uh, the net exports. Right, if you're a very high cost energy country, you're not gonna be exporting much of anything. Their net exports have dropped by 87 billion. Their GDP has been flat. And uh, this is a new coal plant that they've, they've opened in the last two years in Germany. Why? Because of reliability issues. And Chancellor Merkel looks like as of this week is, 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 is on the way out. So uh, there, there are ramifications of having a non-competitive um, you know, uh, electricity uh, generation uh, system. I'll just say one thing just about you know, I don't want to get too much into the, the, the federal policy around energy, but the current administration has been quite a promoter of fracking um, and, and uh, continue to do that. And the largest industry in the United States now should shock you, but this is a new thing. The largest industry by GDP is the energy industry, right? Because of the tremendous growth of what's happened in fracking. Uh, the jobs growth in this country is dominated by energy jobs. These are very high paying jobs. And from an environmental point of view, all of this ease regulation to allow more and more fracking has resulted in an ability to export natural gas to places like India and China. If, we're, if you ask me, if we're gonna do anything, what should be our number one goal to bring down CO2 is figure out how to motivate India and China to burn less coal. And selling them cheap natural gas, I sure like that trade. Um, the United States has had a huge balance of trade problem. I didn't think we would ever become the low cost producer in anything ever again. Right? We're just not a cost competitive uh, country. And lo and behold, it just fell in our lap that we become the world's pretty much low cost producer of energy, especially natural gas. And we can use it for an enormous environmental advantage by sending it to places that are burning coal, which is, uh, which is what we're doing. All right, real quickly on electric vehicles, and then we'll want to leave some time for, for questions. 
Tesla's, this, this one just bugs me, truth in advertising. If I ever, in my investment business, if I ever give false advertising, they, I'm, they, they're putting the, putting the handcuffs on me. Um, we, we, we gotta be down the middle of the plate. So they're not emissions free. Uh, they admit about 125 pounds of CO2 per 300 mile driven, and you know why, because where does electricity come from? It's still dominated by fossil fuels. You get that little tag when you buy your Tesla, it says zero emissions. And people get very excited that this is the answer at zero emissions. It's so far from zero emissions, depending on, on even in Los Angeles, where you see a lot of Teslas, there's still LA Department of Water and Power is still uh, buying coal. They'll phase it out, but coal fire generation from places like Utah and, and Arizona. So uh, electricity in uh, most regions of this country is dominated by fossil fuels. Yes, switching somewhat away from coal to natural gas, but it's not zero. Um, the other thing I'll put in there, do you think um, Doug in San Diego at 55 cents a kilowatt hour is going to uh, sign up for an electric vehicle? Um, my goodness, that electricity is far more expensive than putting gasoline in my car at those kind of electricity rates. So you have kind of an issue here in, in, in California. Not everybody can put solar on their roof. I'm in a homeowners association that doesn't allow solar, which supposedly is illegal, but I've, I've tried and, 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 and not, getting, not gotten anywhere. So I wanted to give you that. Don't forget that we're, we're, we're um, I don't know, we're spoiled in this country. 60% of auto sales are SUVs and light trucks, and electric vehicles remain below 1% of total sales. Um, the, the big cars, the big gas guzzlers are, are flying off the shelves and still dominate what we're driving uh, in, this, uh, in this country. Um, methane, this is just a little different topic. A big, potent greenhouse gas contributor uh, is uh, uncombusted natural gas methane. Um, and there was a lot of buzz that it's, it's fracking that is causing the release of this. And there's a lot of studies, and I think Stanford had done some studies. And if you do the infrared studies of where methane gas leaks are coming, uh, this is Boston. They've got old pipes. Uh, Boston, Washington, D.C., you go back east, natural gas delivery. Um, we got a lot of dollars to spend to, to, to improve these systems. But we've got natural gas leaking all over the place. We had a horrendous natural gas leak in a storage field, Aliso Canyon, uh, back a couple of years ago in Southern California that also wiped out a lot of the benefits of renewables uh, when that goes into the atmosphere. So methane gas leak is a big issue, and uh, it's not been fracking. Uh, it's been from old distribution systems and leaky storage systems around the, uh, around the country. Just on, um, you know, I, I used this. There was a big flurry of divest from fossil fuels in the Stanford Endowment. And I took a picture of a lot of the folks that were camped out at, back then at President Hennessy's office. And I, I put arrows on all the things in their possession that, that came from fossil fuels. And I do think we have to be a little bit on, honest with ourselves in terms of quality of life. And uh, if, if we go to a lot of lesser developed countries, the, many of them, the, the thing that they'll tell you they want most is electricity. Um, and um, you know, if we look at um, um, you know, what fossil fuels are used for, I think the, the um, Let's just say the um, energy literacy in this country is not where it should be. You know, it's, 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 it's important to have passions, but make sure you have the, you have the facts and you have the literacy uh, around things. Uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, a lot of the, the medicines that many people in this room are coming, you know, fossil fuel um, uh, uh, derived. I'll pick on the football team, the football and things like that. Uh, the, the, the carpeting in here, we can go on and on of everything in our possession and a lot of our clothes. Um, you know, fossil fueled, and we think about you know just just what life would be without them, and the quality of life um, with them. Um, you know, it's just something to ponder um, a little bit, and just just make sure here at Stanford. I just hope energy literacy, and there's been a lot of efforts to get energy literacy up, so we're all talking from the same page. Same thing with regards to the the hurricane activities. It's very fashionable to say that you know we the the the, the volume of severe storms is is directly related to, to global warming. I think it's very debatable. If you go back and you take the last 60 year chunks, 1895, we averaged six to seven hurricanes per year. 1955, six to seven hurricanes per year. 2015, six to seven hurricanes per year. I hate when we take data, billions of years of data and try to compress it into the last two years and say that this is now a, this is now a trend. So I think we have to be careful with, uh, with statistics. There we have it. I think I've left 10 or 15 minutes to, to come at me. And uh, so please, uh, please have at it. And I, I will stay around after as well for quite a bit. And, but however you want to do this, John. Great. Uh, we usually start with students, if that's OK. Uh, okay. Let's go away in the back there. Are you a student? Good. Let's go yeah. in the back and then back up. Thanks a lot for your talk. I think um, what was a bit suspicious about it initially, um, you were talking about 
how the US is just a small fraction of the problem. However, you are not talking about the per capita data. So when you're comparing to India or China, each of these countries has four times the population that the US has. So if we look at per capita data, actually the US is the largest emitter of any large country in the world when it comes to CO2. And also, I think it's important to consider that as, as per capita, but, but what's damaging the planet is actual levels of CO2, not per capita, right? Actual levels of CO2. So when we look at actual levels in China and India, they're, they're much higher than, than the United States. You're, you're exactly correct about that, but I think we're trying to get the absolute amount of CO2 down in society, not just to have a winning statistic. I think my point is that we all, like the whole world, has to work on this, and the U.S. is just a small part of the world. And actually, per capita, it's one of the worst, worst contributors of all. And I also want to make a comment to the electricity prices. Um, I'm personally from Germany, and I'm now living in California. And I do well, you know how to pick them. <laughs> I do feel like they're doing fine here. Like, people are doing fine with these prices. That's just my opinion. Thank you for that up here. I'm not doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, if you if you next time you fly uh, from California east and it's a clear day, look down. You're going to see these little dots all over the place. Those are all frack jobs, but you don't see anybody that lives there. So enormous swaths of land in this country where you just don't have big population. So it's just not. It doesn't agitate uh, many people that you do that. The other thing we have royalty rights. We have a legal system um, that is very well defined of who owns that stuff way way down a, a mile down beneath the Earth's surface. So if we go to Europe that uh, plenty of areas have similar rock formations and could frack, uh, a lot closer to population, and not as clear a, a legal system of whose, whose rights uh, they are. So I think I would put those two out as, um, as ones that, that maybe jump off the page towards the top of the list. I would say I'm an economics major, and I like to say that, that economics at the end of the day may take a long time, but economics generally win. The United States is collecting such enormous economic rents, right? So this, is an enormous, this isn't a little product. This is an enormous product where the United States is the low cost producer. You've seen the growth in our GDP. Energy has a lot to do with that. You've seen GDP measures in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, not good. How long will other countries sit there and let the United States gobble up these massive economic rents? I can't see this continuing forever. I think they're gonna get past figuring out how to frack. I would say you're gonna start seeing it proliferating in other parts of the world out of economic necessity. I really do. Let's see. I think there. Oh, sorry. You can there, go. there, and there. OK, back up. Yeah. Um, so right there towards the end of the talk, you're talking about how the methane leaks. Can you uh, speak a little louder? Yeah, so right there towards the end of your talk, methane leaks. Uh, you're talking about how the methane leaks <laughs> yeah. in Southern California undid a lot of the benefits of renewables. But it kind of sounds like they undid a lot of the environmental benefits of natural gas. Did I misunderstand that? Or would you like to? No, I'm just comparing. Off? When you, um, I wasn't s saying. Just, just the data. When methane in an uncombusted form is released into the atmosphere, it is an enormously potent greenhouse gas. The volume of gas, of natural gas, that is leaking into the atmosphere through um, um, old, decaying natural gas distribution systems, and perhaps same thing on some storage systems, when that happens, the, the, it wipes out the benefit. I'm not saying don't do renewables. I'm just comparing the two, that it's a large number relative to the benefit. Yep. Natural gas. That's yeah, that where it's good. coming from. Yeah. It's natural it gas. I, I, I've used the word natural gas. It is from natural gas. So it Absolutely. just increases the emissions of natural gas. Yes. So, there, there's no, so let's go through all, we could go through every form of energy. They also have pros and cons, every single one of them. As pros and nuclear has a safety issue, right, uh, associated with it. I've talked to the, the renewables having an intermittency issue and a cost issue associated with it. Natural gas, while it's abundant and cheap right now, we have leakage. I think we can fix those things, 
by putting dollars into upgrading those systems so we have less of that. But absolutely, there's pros and cons of every form of energy, no doubt about it. Let's go up here, polka dot shirt. Yeah, there's one word I've never heard here in this discussion. It's neg Water. Negative, exter uh, negative externalities. I've never heard it mentioned once. Could we not include it in the actual price of the natural gas and fracking? I think it'd be a better way of viewing what's the future of energy and what's a feasible and, and sustainable way of generating So when you're the negative externalities and fracking, you, you mean the uh, drinking water, no. methane gas leakage, earthquakes, those no. things? The what in Florida? Floods. Like flooding, flooding cities. You know, that's probably related to uh, CO2 emissions in a way or another. But probably, maybe not, I don't know. Huh? There's been a lot of floods in Florida over the years. And another comment on uh, metal. Like you said, there was no emissions related to making metals or anything. When they represent like 7%. I didn't say that, but there are emissions well, related to making metal. You meant that metal did not have any CO2 emissions related to it, related to it when actually 7% of the global CO2 emissions come from coal activities, uh, um, metal activities. So I think it's a couple facts sure. that you could double check. There's a, uh, manufacturing, any kind of manufacturing uh, has uh, CO2 related to it. Really, really anything. Making a Tesla has got a lot of CO2 related to that, anything. I agree with you. Let's go back here on that up. You talked a little bit earlier in the presentation about how there's a negative public perception that comes from nuclear power plants. Just yeah. Of yeah. Them being shut down in that yes. sense. Nuclear uh, negative public opinion regarding nuclear. Yes. And then in that same sense, um, I've read a couple articles about earthquakes <coughs> that um, come from fracking. Would you rank those like realistically, not in public opinion, is one greater than the other? Well, okay, let me talk about earthquakes around fracking very quickly. I think that the public perception around nuclear post Fukushima, well, I'll go back post Three Mile Island, post the movie China Syndrome, there was a, there was a poll done how many people were, were uh, lost their lives in the Three Mile Island accident, and the average response to that was 500 people lost their life, and the answer is zero. But public perception is, 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 is kind of what, what matters, and we won't get into the different designs of different nuclear plants, but there is a... a, a uh, among a lot of people, a pretty severe perception around the safety of, of nuclear power and the disposal of, of, of waste. I think the earthquake thing is, is uh, personally, is, is a little bit overblown relative to that. If you ask people in Oklahoma, um, you know, and, and it's a little different between a San Andreas fault and the water that's re-injected from fracking, the water that comes out and re-injected, which causes the earth to settle. Uh, this is not like two plates moving. And um, I think people in Oklahoma are not saying we don't want fracking, we like the economic benefit, and the earth shifts once in a while, we'll, we'll deal with it. So I don't think it's actually close in terms of the perception between those two. I think the new, it's a personal opinion that I think the, the emotions around nuclear are a lot higher than the earthquakes around, around fracking. Okay, up personal. here, and then there, and then in the back. Go. So I, I, think, I think a lot of the points that you brought up are definitely valid and, and worth looking at in a lot more detail. I'm curious, on, from your perspective, what would you hope, I mean, many of us in this room are hoping on working on the huge infrastructure transition that will happen over the next, you know, however many decades. What would you hope us to learn from the harsh lessons of this? Sure. What would you suggest that we might focus our work so, on the coming decades? So I'm investing when we include, I, I, I said equity, that I invest $20 billion uh, while well, ever my projects. So I've, in, in the last 12 years, invested maybe $50 billion dollars in the United States in energy infrastructure. I don't know if we're the largest, but, but just about. Uh, the math has to work, right? The numbers have to add up. Um, m m my job is to make good investment returns for my investors, uh, follow the rules uh, around safety, reliability, and environmental compliance, because I'm out of business. I mess up in one, one area there, um, I'm out of business. But I've got to do this in a cost. I have to do projects that are cost effective uh, that society wants and will pay for. Otherwise, they don't happen. And so I think the focus, of, there's a lot of infrastructure dollars being spent. But you want to focus on things that society will pay for and society needs. I would say that would be my kind of litmus test when I focused on where should I focus my efforts. We have an aged infrastructure in this country in everything, right? Transportation, roads, energy that has to be fixed. And for your generation, you know, there's going to be a lot, a lot of projects to straighten this out. 
Pastor, if you are. Uh, Ma'am, in the middle there. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to address your comment about Oklahoma. So I was. Oh, are you from Oklahoma? Yes, born and raised. Um, How do you feel about earthquakes? Uh, very strongly, negatively. Um, it went from. First 15 years of my life, we never had any earthquakes, and in the past 10 years, it's actually gone to um, the region of the world that has the most earthquakes daily, um, including California. Um, and What's the average on the Richter scale? What's the average um, level? Generally of between like two to four, so it's right. true that... The, what level do you need to be able to feel an earthquake? Um, I've felt personally once between three and four. Three, I, I think three is roughly like below three and I can't feel. Yeah, exactly. But I just wanted to comment that um, it's been felt strongly enough that uh, Oklahoma has actually implemented regulations to decrease fracking. So I think the statement that um, Oklahomans don't want to completely stop fracking is maybe a little overblown and it is something that has right. caused a negative impact on the community. The, the volume of oil and natural gas production out of Oklahoma has increased every year for the past 10 years. Slightly mis to represent it. It's an issue. It's an issue. I've done some reading about um, financial crisis that could be let, that the debt related to fracking could lead to. Do you mind talk, talking debt, about debt into yeah, fracking? Yeah, a lot of debt that's um, used in the fracking industry to prop up fracking. And I'm just curious if you could explain that connection and if sure. your thoughts on. Analysts saying that it might lead to that's unstable might lead to. So uh, this is this is finance, and in in uh, finance, um, you want to build your investment with the lowest cost capital as possible. So debt is cheaper than equity, mainly in this country because you're allowed to deduct the interest expense. But we're in a period of very low interest rates, so um, you're trying to maximize your returns. Equity is expensive, right? So whether you're building an apartment building or you're investing in an oil and gas well, you're gonna put as, as, as much debt that is prudent because it's, it's lower cost. Um, uh, money has been easy in this country for quite some time. And so um, most oil and gas projects have been able to borrow 50%, some cases maybe a little higher debt, it's cheaper. And so a, a developer is an economic being, he has investors, he wants to maximize his returns, he's not doing an evil thing. Uh, he's reducing his cost of capital. It's probably the first thing in econ one or finance class uh, you, you learn about. So the question is, if oil and gas prices plummet, um, will, will there be bankruptcies? Will those developers lose their project? Yes, there will be bankruptcies if oil and gas prices plummet uh, from where they are because there's a fair amount of leverage in the system. Whether that's good or bad, I can say the same thing about the real estate business. I can say that about any business. If the price of the product goes down dramatically, um, people won't be able to service the debt. Let's do one more student question. And I'll stay around for more. <laughs> so, thank you so much for your presentation. I, I do think you brought some, some different perspectives perhaps than most of us are exposed to on a regular Good. basis. I try. Um, I wanted to return very briefly and, and slightly in a different way to the question of externalities when it comes to climate change. You said that you, um, you want the best options for your investors. You want uh, an incentive structure that drives you towards uh, the best investments for the long term. Would you support a higher sort of price on carbon to be incorporated into investments that you would make in fossil fuels based on the fact that um, estimated costs from climate change are going to be in the hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars in the next few decades? Sure. So from an investor point of view, right, which is very different from a personal preference point of view, but from an investor point of view, I just want rules. I just want rules and I want rules that don't change. Tell me what the facts are. If you want to put a carbon tax, you know, fine. And, and there's a lot of different ways to structure it. Just tell me what it is, and I'll work that into my investment, and I'll price it, and we'll go forward. Generally, any of those, that's going to be passed on to the consumer. That's going to mean a higher cost energy. I've got no issues for you. There are externalities. There's no debating that there's not externalities. And, and make sure that, that high cost now versus externality costs down the road. Exactly. Well, if you're going to put a tax on it to be collecting funds to deal with those issues down the road, somebody's going to have to pay for that. The way that most any product works, right, the price of the product goes up. It's not that I'm going to say, okay, I'll take an 8% return when I really want 12. I'm still going to want a 12% return. And if I can't get a 12% return investing in energy because there's an externality that I have to pay for, I will go build an apartment building. I will no longer invest in energy, and therefore the projects won't happen. It's a, it's a competitive market for capital in the world, 
And so that's fine to put anything you want on this, which may be very valid from a societal point of view. I would think it would be valid from a societal point of view, but that's going to be passed on to the consumer, just like you saw my 55 cent uh, electric bill. Uh, but if I'm going to invest in, in, I don't really care that it's 55 versus 10 from an investment point of view, I'm still going to demand my 12% rate of return, no matter what the rules are. If the rules keep changing, I'm going to demand a higher rate of return, which is going to cost the consumer even more. And one of the problems in this country is our politics and the rules keep changing. And so I have to put a risk factor in in any investment because I don't know what the rules are going to be for the next 10 years. It's, it's hard, it's a, it makes it hard to invest. Uh, two things Good in closing. Question. If you're really interested in climate impacts, uh, the, the uh, Global Energy Forum is taking place on campus here on Thursday and Friday. Uh, Doug will actually be a speaker, as will Chris Field. I've been trying not to do too much on the climate impact side in this series because it's really a Woods Institute thing. If you want to do it here, I, we know all the people and we could do it. We could even have Chris talk. We have had, had some of the people in his group. I think some of the numbers coming out of the press coverage of the IPCC are not very credible, but I do think uh, I was on the National Academy Social Cost of Carbon Committee. I do think the numbers in there are probably about right, but they're more like $40 a ton as opposed to 400 So we could do lots of more things. I encourage you all to get educated on that side, as Doug mentioned. I have actually looked at storm damage uh, estimates re recently. I would say there's a tendency for the scientists to focus on the instrumental record, and they don't actually tell you that the instrumental record goes back maybe not two years, but maybe 20 years, 30 years. And if you go back to the Dust Bowl era or the, the drenching of California that took place in a particular ENSO event, you'll see it's not that unusual. I would argue it's probably getting worse, but it's not like night and day. So anyways, with that, let's say you're going to be around for a little bit. Yeah, more. Thank you. Great. Good job.